Hello everyone and welcome back to the Palladian Academy Let's Play. I, Palladian, am your host. And today I want to start by talking about some issues to do with durability and repair. So I need to grab, I need to grab, let's use this, or this. And um, I'll leave those there for now. The reason why I have, uh, why I'm concerned about this topic once again is because of the truly staggering amount of uh, sh shovel use that I'm going to go through to get enough snow to build my iron golem farm. I've worked it out. The total amount left, not even that I still have to, not not from the start, the total amount left that I still have to obtain snow is 18,000 blocks. That's a lot of snow blocks. And remember that each snow block uses four uses of a shovel. So I'm using diamond shovels with unbreaking enchantments on them to decrease the sheer number of shovels that I have to use, but the overall number of shovels that I will have to use is something like 12. So 12 unbreaking 3 diamond shovels. Now, what I wanted to know was, what is the most efficient way to use them to use the least possible number of diamonds? So, I read up on the wiki about repair, and it says that when you repair an item like this, you get um, the durability of this item plus the durability of this item plus 10% of the overall durability of the item you're repairing. So in this case, the overall du the maximum durability is 384. So we divide that by 10 to get 10%. That would be 38, rounded down. So what we should see is 92 plus 67 which is um, 159, 159 plus 38, which is 189, 197. <coughs> so is it 197? No, it is not, it's 178. So what I found out using a little bit of experimentation is that the wiki is not correct, at least in terms of if you're repairing it there. I haven't actually tested what the difference is if you're repairing it on a crafting table. It potentially could be different. Let's find out. I've got one just lying around here. Oh, alright, let's see if it's different. No, okay, so if you use a crafting table to repair or if you use this little crafting grid that you've got in your inventory to repair, you actually get 5% rounded down. So for bows, that would be um, 38 of 219. You get 19 additional points repaired. Actually, I want to go up here. Show you something else. Now, when you repair an item on the anvil, you don't get 5%, you don't get 10%, you actually get 12%. So let me show you. If I take these two, it would take me some levels to repair it this much, but you get a lot more as a result. So, using these mechanics, I have worked out how I can best repair um, a shovel, which is Silk Touch, Efficiency 5, Unbreaking 3, and also any general use shovel, which is either Efficiency 4, I'm breaking 3, or Efficiency 5, I'm breaking 3, or just I'm breaking 3, whatever. Fortune is a different animal again, because Fortune is 4 experience levels more expensive than, than is Silk Touch to repair. But it's also possible. So, there is the net result of all of my testing and so on is that in order to repair a tool like this, uh, not this, uh, tool like this, which I've misnamed, but anyway, 
I'm breaking efficiency 5. That would be my regular shovel for any kind of duties that I need. Digging dirt or gravel or anything like that. <coughs> if I want to fix that up completely, it will cost, I think, 33 levels. And the maximum dura sorry, the minimum durability I have to have on the shovel I'm using to repair it with is um, 1374. The maximum durability I can have on a shovel that I use to repair my silk touch shovel Whoa! Like it. As I was saying, the maximum amount of durability I can have on a shovel that I'm using to repair my silk touch shovel, this one here, is 1,112. So, now that we know that, I can repair them without end, and everything will be fine. So, just to show you how it works, I've got this shovel. The shovel has uh, 1,099 durability left on it. Uh, that was what I thought would be the right amount, but it turns out that it's um, 1,112 is the maximum, uh, but I can repair that amount plus 12% of 1561, which is um, 187 of this, this shovel, and it, as you can see it costs 39 levels, so it's doable in survival, no problem. This episode is going to be a little bit choppy, so I hope that you'll forgive me, but the idea is that I will do a bunch of stuff in between each um, each cut and just kind of continue talking as if there had been no cuts at all and you'll see huge amounts of progress and it'll look really cool so hopefully that's how it turns out. So one thing I want to do is show you a little bit of the progress of my iron farm so far. As you can see I've got some platforms built already. Each of these platforms are where a cell is going to go. Each of these platforms is where a cell is going to go. Come on, load in. As many chunks have taken time. Anyway, I realized a mistake on one of these things. Where's the mistake? There it is. As you can see, I'm using sand pillars with huge numbers of ladders. I stopped throwing away the sticks that my witch farm was producing and started making them into ladders. So that's been very useful. Um yeah, that's working quite well. Uh, so you can see light glitches, but apart from that, you can see I've got one there, one here, one here. So that's three towers of four cells, so twelve. There'll be another tower of four cells there, and another one that way. So I will in total have 20 cells. I decided not to use the uh, new type of design because I'm not really sure how reliable it is. And I really want this to stand the test of time if possible because it's a huge investment in terms of time. As you can well imagine. Give me that block. Oh, can't pick it up. I don't need glass balls. And of course, if I want to get down, do it safely. Lovely. I've also excavated huge amounts of dirt to do the stuff down here. This is the design I was thinking of for the tunnels the golems fall down. I actually miscalculated. I thought that I needed a lot more 
silk touch shovels than I actually did four times more. So this is the current state of the build. I dug out these tunnels and this is the down there is where the iron golems are finally going to die. These tunnels are for transporting them. And I'm thinking of building some sort of storage system or something down here. I'm not really sure exactly. I might make this the storage area because obviously my base is going to be centered around this central golden farm pillar thing. I mean. I don't know if you can tell, but I significantly increased the size of my ice farm, so now it is very, very productive. It's working brilliantly. I can just walk down, breaking everything with my silk touch shovel, and by the time I'm down the other end, it's ready to harvest on this side again. The other thing is that I've been getting a lot of wood because I need a ton of signs, of course. So I think I've got some wood left, or some signs, and I actually need that. Uh, but I'll get them later. Creeper got me. Yep. I didn't die, but I lost a good amount of material here. One of my cardinal rules of building is to use blast-proof materials, and unfortunately there are no easily accessible white blast proof blocks so and I've chosen to build this whole thing out of snow so unfortunately that is that one two three four five two three four five oh, which means my creeper blows up it's very punishing I had no time to react he was up on this platform above, I was down here, I killed the two skeletons that were on here, and he got me. So I'm not going to let that happen again, I brought a bajillion torches, and I'm going to place light safety. But unfortunately, what's done is done. Something there, yes. And there. Okay. I also died before I was working on the up, the uppermost platform, and I don't have any feather falling boots. I've got feather falling book, but I'm waiting for some decent other enchantments, so I can put that on to diamond boots. But yeah, so that is the lesson learned. Always place light. One, two, three, four. And these I'll just pick up when I flood these platforms. I know this is boring, don't worry. I've got a very juicy topic lined up for today, and that is the philosophy of history. See, I could tell you a fact like in 49 AD, Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon, but that doesn't really tell you very much about the event, does it? History is not just a collection of bare facts. What the historian has to do is to explain to us the motivations or the reasons why things happened. 
So it's whenever we're doing history. So if I want to say, talk about Julius Caesar, his action that he took when he crossed the Rubicon, which is a river in Italy, um, I have to tell you why did he cross. Well, I have to give you some explanation why I think he crossed it, what he was thinking when he took that action. And I will do that because I've been studying up a little bit about Gaius Julius Caesar over the last day or so in preparation for this video. The Rubicon is, uh, as I said, it's a river in Italy. It flows east-west, and it marked, at the time that Julius Caesar was alive, it marked the border between um, Upper Italy and the Roman kind of area. So it um, it's like a border. It's almost like a national border. And the reason why, um, see, I have to explain all sorts of stuff. So it was a very provocative action that Caesar took when he crossed the Rubicon because he crossed it at the head of his armies. He had been in Gaul, which is now France, and to a certain extent. Um, Switzerland and Belgium. He had been in Gaul for the last, for the past um, ten years or so. He had been ca campaigning on behalf of the Senate and people of Rome, SPQR, which means Senatus, uh, oh, something I can't remember. Um, he'd been campaigning in Gaul, Gaul for the last, for the, for the past ten years, and his campaigns there had gained him a lot, a lot of fame, both within um, Roman society and from his enemies, because he was very successful. He had a lot of luck as well, but he was um, the luck that he had made him made him stronger, made him more successful. So he's very politically popular and he was very militarily popular. His troops really loved him. <coughs> now the, the senators, the uh, the ruling body, woo, the ruling body of Rome knew this as well and they were afraid of him. So they did the equivalent of excommunicating him. They marginalized him in various ways. Tried to limit his political influence. Unfortunately, this didn't work because he had allies within the Senate as well. And as a result, um, he wasn't marginalized as much as they had hoped. But after his 10 years campaigning in Gaul, he was told to disband his armies and he was going to be a nobody again, or just a, a regular person. Now, obviously, he didn't want that. So what he did was he led his armies across the Rubicon and this was an illegal act and it was punishable by death. So. In taking that action, he had made all of his soldiers and himself, um, by law, criminals and condemned to death, enemies of the people. When the senators heard about this action, they were terrified and they fled. Um, there were some powerful uh, members of the Senate. There's uh, a at the time, there was a position called the consul, uh, consul rather, C-O-N-S-U-L, 
which was the highest office in the Senate. It's like a president or a prime minister if you live in different types of countries. So in effect, yep, zombie. Ah. The sword is nearly gone. Caesar had been consul as well, um, but it was a limited office, limited to one year. Um, Caesar sought that office again when he arrived with his armies, and the people gave it to him. And surprise, surprise, he extended the term to first to five years. And this is easier if I do it this way. First to five years, and then after that, he just did away with pretense and made it perpetual. So he became the perpetual dictator. And that was literally what he what uh, his title was, uh, dictator in perpetuity. I think that's where we get the term dictator from. Caesar was the first dictator, or at least by name. So Caesar became a military dictator. He led a military coup. Not sounding like one of the nicest people ever, is it? Um, I always thought that Caesar was a rather amiable chap. Um, interested in the good of the people of Rome and that sort of thing, but um, Seems that was not the case. He actually just wanted personal power. In that cause, he fought against um, some of his closest allies from the last um, number of years. Oh, actually, I don't want to go up there. He had two main allies in the Senate during the time that he was in Gaul, who were supporting him back home, as it were. Um, and he fought against both of them. I believe he even killed one. Or one of them died as a result of his, the civil war that he precipitated. So that was unfortunate for him, I'm sure. Anyway, so that goes a fair way towards explaining why Caesar crossed the Rubicon. He um, essentially he created a condition which would necessarily precipitate a civil war because he was extremely popular. He was at the head of four legions of troops, and Roman law dictated that he had to be put to death. Um, so of course, he nullified that law by beating everybody. But why was he in Gaul in the first place? See, we can keep going back. The reason he was in Gaul was because before before his Gaulic campaign, he was the consul, as I said before. And during his time as consul, he spent a lot of other people's money, as a result of which he had huge public debts. And in those days, you couldn't just leave the public debt to the next person to get elected. He had to deal with them himself. He had to get the money somehow. So what he thought he would do is he would lead a campaign against the wealthy Celtic peoples and the Gaulish pe peoples and various other like the Helvetians and others, take their wealth and use it to pay off his debts. This did not work out perfectly um, because the troops that he had used while he was um, effectively in exile for 10 years, not really in exile, but he was away from Rome for 10 years, he promised them a lot of extra pay and when he then called upon them to fight in the civil war, they asked for their back pay. Now, he managed to use his political nous to get himself out of that one, but ultimately what this resulted in was that uh, Caesar was in a lot of debt. 
and that is the reason why he went to war in the first place, or at least it's one of the reasons. I'm sure one of the other reasons was because he wanted to gain influence. He was a very, very canny political man. As I said, he had other very canny political um, allies in the Senate, one of whom was the consul at the time that he started the Civil War, and another one who was financing everything, although evidently not financing some of Caesar's stuff, because, uh, I don't know, maybe it was just too too rich for him. It's too much money to spend. Anyway, all of this is to say that when we're trying to understand history, we're not just interested in the pure facts. Pure facts are actually of very little use. If I just told you that Caesar crossed the Ubrick Rubicon, that has no meaning for you whatsoever. But if I tell you what I've just told you, then you can start to understand the conditions that caused Caesar to cross the Rubicon, and it might even give you some... Um, out of the edges. It, it might even give you an increased ability to understand things in your own life. Uh, a good example of that would be, well, you know that Caesar was very popular, um, but the reason he was popular was not because he was particularly good person, not because he was particularly um, good for the people, um, keeping Rome from becoming a tyranny, he did the precise opposite. So, as a man of the people, he was very popular, but as a protector of Rome, of the freedoms and the um, the character of the Roman Republic, he was its worst enemy because he destroyed the Roman Republic. So, politicians can look really good, they can say things that sound very nice, but ultimately they can turn out to be like Julius Caesar. Ultimately, producing tyranny. And that is exactly the sort of thing that Star Wars is about. If you've watched any of the earlier Star Wars movies, I mean the um, episodes 1, 2, and 3, they essentially make into a space opera the events following Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon. Although in Star Wars they produce a fake civil war, whereas Caesar was fighting a real civil war, and there were a few chances where he definitely could have lost. So it wasn't a sure thing by any chance. When he crossed the Rubicon, he famously said, or is said to have famously said, the words, Alia Yakta Est, which means the die is cast. In other words, we've rolled the dice, now we have to see where they fall. And as it turned out for Caesar, they fell in a very pleasant place, because he then became dictator. Unfortunately for him, not everybody looks kindly on dictatorship, so he was later assassinated, again, famously. So it doesn't always work out the way you want. Um, but... Caesar's actions ultimately led from Rome, led to Rome becoming, instead of a republic, which is what it was initially set up to be, it became the Roman Empire. The Roman Republic lasted for 500 years, then came Julius Caesar. Of course, there was decay the whole time, but Julius Caesar was the linchpin. He twisted the um, 
he turned the dial from republic to dictatorship and he cleared the way for his later successor Caesar Augustus to go from to convert the Roman Republic completely into a an empire dictatorship and that is how the Roman Empire roughly came about. I hope that this has been interesting to you and this is Palladian PD. I'm signing out.